that's great. Well, hello everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining me uh, to explore uh, a topic that's dear to my heart, uh, systems thinking in the context of healthcare interoperability. Um, we're going to uh, take a look at the problem of healthcare interoperability, uh, the conventional approach to solve this problem, which has become part of the problem, and then uh, the systems thinking approach. Einstein uh, was quoted as saying, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about solutions. Uh, I hope by uh, the end of this session, uh, this quote uh, would have uh, resonated with you uh, a bit more. So let's have a look on what it is interoperability uh, in the context of um, healthcare. So this was me back in 2007. I didn't look very happy and I wasn't. I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, it started with a, fam uh, with a visit to my family doctor. Uh, in the year uh, that followed, uh, I was in and out of hospitals, uh, diagnostic imaging labs, specialist offices, pharmacies, um, everywhere I visited. Uh, if it's the first time I visit, um, I uh, had to fill out a paper form about my medical history, my family history, um, and my allergies, basic information. And um, my uh, test results, uh, diagnosis, post-op notes, uh, was communicated to my family doctor uh, through faxes and photocopies. Uh, this was the paper record era. Um, so, um, you can imagine by the end of my treatment, uh, my uh, medical records uh, is a thick bender of hard copy printouts. So, but there are, uh, you know, very limited level of interoperability between uh, the different practices and uh, the providers. Um, around the same time I was diagnosed with breast cancer, there was a push to implement electronic health record. I think in the year I completed my treatment, um, EHR, uh, electronic health record, really started taking hold in the health uh, IT industry. Uh, in Ontario, Canada, where I am, the provincial government established an agency uh, to do just that. The U.S. government, federal government, um, passed a law uh, essentially providing incentives to healthcare providers and health IT vendors to adopt EHR. So we kind of entered the EHR era. But putting these records into the computers, it's not a simple matter. It requires special terminologies and a, a whole uh, set of standards to be uh, in place. Uh, give you uh, a few examples of what uh, these terminologies and standards might be. Uh, on top of the list is ICD, stands for uh, International Classification of Diseases. The one below SNOMAT CT is a standard for clinical terminology. LOINC is for images, x-rays, CT scans, so on. RX norm is for drugs, CCD is for clinical summary, so on and so forth. None of these would cover 100%. Uh, so there are always local codes. There are free taxes for doctors to put extra notes. New conditions, diseases, treatments, drugs uh, keeps come up. So each healthcare provider and each uh, health IT vendor uh, have the choice to take the standards uh, that fit their practices. Um, so fast forward to today, uh, EHRs have become commonplaces and PDF records are shared uh, 
among the practitioners uh, instead of uh, uh, hard copy paper records. Now that we have uh, EHRs, we've digitized uh, our medical records, so we want more. We now want the machines, the computers, to interpret uh, these health records. So in a sense, to understand semantically what is communicated. So it's the digitalization process we're entering so that the machines can help us make clinical decisions, uh, assist the doctors. Um, what I heard from uh, my work in this area is doctors actually make mistakes for up to 50% of the time. So you can imagine the push for uh, machines to help with clinical decision support. So we entered the semantic era. However, uh, we have a problem with the different standards and the customizations of each practice and each system, these machines don't really speak the same language or the same dialect. So we have a power of Babel problem. That means, how do you, how do, you do this? So looking back into uh, uh, how we got here, uh, we very much followed a linear analytical approach to uh, the progression. We had a paper record, we digitized them. Now uh, we want the machines to interpret them, um, except we hate a wall. But we soldiered on. We said, no problem. The systems don't speak the same language. We can uh, build the translators. We can map these different standards and terminologies. We can synchronize the terminologies so they're consolidated. We can re-engineer standardizing the applications and the systems, integrating them. We can even implement new systems that use cutting edge, better terminologies. So I call these um, engineering or tweaking the parts, except one thing they didn't get us far and we still stuck right here at the wall and we seem to be keep pounding on the wall and hiding into a black hole what went wrong re-engineering the parts would have worked if we have a closed system with only a few applications or a few providers in place for example, if there are only five, if there is only one hospital or even two, then we can actually integrate, we can map away, we can standardize, we can tweak and everything, it will work. However, we are in a different situation. We don't have just a closed, a few system. Uh, we have essentially an open system with hundreds and thousands of providers and uh, EHR vendors uh, in the US, there are over 700 government certified EHR vendors uh, implementing uh, uh, electronic health, health records across uh, the continent. So these two are different things. In the, in the open network, it's simply not feasible to map away the terminologies in every system to the terminologies in every other system or integrate every system. So how did we get here? So how did we not see this was coming? How did we miss the big problem? So it turns out that there are two very different categories of problems. One category is called inherent problems. Uh, these are the problems with the component parts. An example would be a broken wrist, which is an inherent problem of the human body as a system. A flat tire would be an inherent problem of the car. Uh, the thing is uh, that fixing the parts fix the problem. Now, there is a whole category of opposite problems 
where fixing the parts will not help. And this category of problems is called emergent problems. These problems arise or emerge, emerge through the interactions of the parts. So they are the problems with the whole, not with the parts. Each individual parts may work just fine, but when, when they interact, something goes wrong. And, and the thing is, fixing the parts may not fix the problem, and worse, may cause more problems down the road. An example of the emergent problem is a malignant tumor, COVID-19, and almost all social cultural problems. Systems with emergent problems or systems where emergent problems reside are referred as complex systems and systems where uh, inherent problems reside are often referred as complicated systems. Uh, of course, complex systems also um, have complicated uh, problems. Uh, that's not the point. Uh, understanding the difference between these two systems is critical for us to understand emergent problems and therefore finding solutions. So the difference to me between the two systems is the difference between a flock of migrating birds and a space rocket. You can say, of course they're different, but we have to understand at the behavioral level how uh, the two systems operate. Um, let's have a look at um, uh, migrating birds. Uh, my favorite example. Um, we've known for a long time that birds uh, migrate uh, thousands of miles, but we didn't know how they do it. Until recently, uh, shockingly, surprisingly, until 2014, uh, scientists in England discovered that birds follow a very few simple rules, essentially three simple rules uh, when flying, when migrating. Uh, um, the first rule is their position. Um, each bird uh, uh, flies uh, in the position that's close to the wing tape of the bird in front of it, and therefore they form a V uh, formation. Um, as the bird uh, flaps its wings, um, the air flying off, flowing off, uh, the wind tapes, uh, you know, uh, gives the bird in the back an extra lift. Uh, this reduces the amount of energy needed for the bird in the back. So that's rule number one. Rule number two um, is over the course of uh, the migration, birds take turns to lead in the very front uh, of the V formation, uh, the most difficult position. Uh, this allows them to recharge. And the third basic rule is the timing of their flaps. Um, birds actually synchronize their beats, their wind beats. This allows them to make rapid course corrections simultaneously and uh, adapt to changing environments, uh, such as when a falcon approaches. Now, here is the interesting part, no single bird, however strong, would ever be able to make the long journey by itself. Not a single bird, but by flocking together in a V formation and by following a few simple rules, there emerge this remarkable capability of the migrating birds as a whole. And interestingly, again, each bird self-organizes and operates autonomously. At the same time, the birds are interdependent in order to accomplish their shared mission in an open system. So that's the complex system. I think that's the gist and the beauty of a complex system. Um, let's have a quick mention of a complicated system such as a space rocket. What the difference is? 
first of all, the parts in the space rocket do not self-organize. <laughs> they cannot imagine these parts decide to do something on its own. No, they don't. They actually uh, operate based on precise instructions and rule sets uh, given by the central processing unit, the brain of the space rocket. So they just wait there until the instructions are there. So, you know, it's by design. And the other thing is the space rocket, it's a closed system. And, and, and there are hundreds and thousands of rules uh, governing and operating and guiding the interactions of the parts in a rocket. Um, unlike in a complex system such as a flock of bird. Now, in addition to these, uh, there are two things about complex systems <clears throat> that would help us understand um, uh, 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 the basics. Uh, one of them is a perfect understanding of the component parts does not convey a perfect understanding of the system as a whole. Uh, we can study individual birds, uh, there are uh, habits, life cycle, but that would not tell us anything about how a flock of birds are flying thousands of miles. The second point is the system as a whole can only be seen or experienced through the interactions of the parts. So examining individual parts will never show the behavior of the whole, which is a emergent behavior. And that's why the term emergent problems. So the behavior of the whole is the result of the interactions of the parts. So let's go back to how did we get, you know, why did we follow the path we followed uh, when we were faced with a uh, healthcare interoperability problem. Um, like many things uh, in life, uh, we have two brains, all of us have. And one is uh, the abstract brain, I call it the analytical brain. And the other is actually, I call it the systems brain. Um, the difference is the analytical brain is responsible for breaking uh, breaking things down into smaller chunks so that we can better understand it. So it's very, very suited for understanding complicated or simple systems and are very uh, effective in solving uh, inherent problems. Um, and, and however, uh, the reason this brain is getting bigger and bigger is during uh, the past century, uh, we uh, increasingly specialized in uh, this analytical brain to the exclusion of our system's brain. They actually started shrinking. The two brains are supposed to work together simultaneously. Uh, um, I could spend five minutes on this slide, um, but I don't have that time. If you're interested, um, Ian McGillcrest's book, The Master and His Emissary, uh, really does an amazing job to describe. It's a thick over 500 books, but it's, it's, it's fascinating. So anyway, as a result of, of our uh, industrial revolution, and basically scientific revolution, uh, we have become unidimensional and boringly predictable, as you have seen how we perceived the healthcare interoperability problem from our analytical mind. And we kind of started neglecting the system's mind. It is no wonder we are almost clueless in uh, perceiving, uh, formulating, and solving uh, emergent problems. So what can we do about it? How can we uh, rediscover our innate ability, uh, innate ability to think um, uh, um, systemically? So um, I like um, there are a few things we can do uh, to, to practice this. So this is uh, the few things that I want to share uh, with you here. Um, so this is the uh, very well-known story of the blind man and the elephant. Um, the parable has been used as metaphors in many, many fields. Um, but the point that I want to make here 
is about the importance of the whole context, the complete context. In this story, in this parable, uh, without any preconceived notion of what an elephant looks like, all efforts by the group of blind men to identify the elephant by touching uh, its different parts uh, proved to be ineffective. So having different perspectives may not help us perceive or visualize the whole. And therefore, uh, when we face emergent problems, it is important um, to kind of consciously think of uh, these few things. First is uh, try to synthesize and visualize the system as a whole, now not uh, dive into a specific individual parts as we conventionally um, um, uh, uh, enjoy doing. Uh, the second is formulate problems not for individual parts, but uh, as interactions of the parts. So formulating problems of the whole, not the parts. You know, once we've done this, we can actually start designing the systems, you know, as interactions of the parts. So we're really designing interactions. So these three things, visualize the whole, formulate problems, and we design interactions. So let's see how this applies to uh, healthcare interoperability problem. Let's visualize a interoperable healthcare uh, network. So we know that um, your medical records are scattered across different practitioners. You may have uh, your uh, childhood history with your pediatrician. You definitely have something with your family doctor. The hospitals you visited have a piece of your information. The pharmacist knows the drugs you're taking, your allergies, even your personal wearable devices, you know, know uh, your uh, vital signs, your exercise routines, so on and so forth. However, um, you don't actually have a comprehensive view of these records. You don't have them in one place that would remind you of the interactions of the different conditions or different health concerns that you may have. On the other hand, each practitioner, each care provider, be it a hospital, uh, doctor, each they see a lot of patients. However, they only have a sliver of the information for each patient because of the other informations are scattered somewhere um, else. So decisions are often made narrowly within a specific context. You know, your heartbeat may be really high because you just ran a marathon or a sprint. So that doesn't say anything. You have to put it in a context. So nothing is really you know, often uh, doctors make decisions not within uh, the context of uh, your overall health. So what if we could aggregate these data? Leveraging data analytics, machine learning, AI. Imagine not just uh, you have a comprehensive view of your health history, Doctors have it too, so they're not making decisions in a narrow context. And not just for the patient. Um, um, the system as a whole should be able to discover new uh, patterns and generate new levels of insights that would uh, benefit public health, uh, precision medicine, mental health uh, assessments, medical research, clinical trial, you name it. So this is what the whole should look like. That means we have a complete view of not just individual patients, but we can generate insights for uh, uh, special fields, um, uh, special purposes, uh, or any needs that arise, uh, such as the COVID situation. Um, but why are we not there yet? 
uh, why haven't we built a system sort of going into this direction? We kind of know vaguely uh, we're hiding over to this and everybody talked about this, but we're somehow missing uh, um, this concept. So, so what uh, are the potential uh, problems with this whole? So remember the three things, visualize the whole, we just did that quickly. And then the second thing is formulate the problems of the whole or the interactions. And let's check that out. We have a very diverse network, meaning the participants could be patient, family doctors, specialists, uh, public health, researchers, payer, hospital, labs, insurance, pharmaceuticals, and there are poten potentially thousands of them. As we've um, mentioned, it's not feasible for each one of them to uh, uh, connect directly with uh, everyone else. So in order for us to aggregate information for them, for each of these providers to communicate uh, with each other, what we need is actually a simple exchange, a place where they can actually exchange all these information. And so these uh, dispersed systems can actually connect and share data and benefit uh, in return. So this uh, leads us to uh, exchanges or uh, marketplaces. So, well, exchanges and marketplaces are not new concepts at all. Uh, they have uh, existed since the beginning, uh, from uh, ancient bazaars to farmers markets to credit bureaus to uh, today's uh, tech darlings, uh, we've seen it all. Um, so um, so uh, keep in mind about credit bureaus because I'm going to come back to this very quickly um, uh, as soon as after this uh, slide. So uh, we- I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt, uh, Joanne. Uh, we have about a few minutes left and I would love to hear <laughs> your concluding remarks if you want to bring this home before, I, we, before yes. we take a final question. Yes, I think I'm almost there. Um, so the purpose of these are facilitated exchanges between self-organizing interdependent groups and the business model, uh, the type of business is called a platform business. And the differences of this, you can look, it's very clear. And uh, this is the case for health information exchange. We need an open network, the core values and core transactions. And this is just a PS. So this very much concludes uh, uh, the presentation. And uh, we've gone through the problem, the conventional approach, uh, the system thinking approach. So um, thank you, Guru. Um, I'm ready for questions if there are any. That is fantastic. Uh, you've created so much engagement in the chat. You won't believe it. We, <laughs> it's a, it's a, and I'm going to take one question as we wrap this up. And it would be great if you maybe can unshare your screen. I think that might help our audio. Okay. Um, how? Stop. Okay. Perfect. Oh my goodness. Uh, be like the birds, right? There's so much to learn from that inherent behavior. And I think you've inspired so many people here to investigate what cooperation and, and collaboration is, for example. And you, you'll see all about that in the chat. I would love Thank to take one, one final question coming from Chris, who asks, uh, how do you think about points of intervention in complex systems? Do you have any specific examples that you can share? Um, um, that's, yes, yes, um, I call it acupuncture points. So we tend to think of intervention, interventions as destructive. We have to destroy the whole system before we can improve. And um, that's actually not true. If you observe nature, it's always um, um, uh, adapting to the environment, uh, you know, in the case of healthcare interoperability, the EHRs do not need to be thrown away, but the, the intervention points or the acupuncture points, it's really to say, ah, we need a marketplace. 
And I think that would have to come from um, private sector uh, innovation and private sector engagement. I haven't seen government, because these entities like credit bureaus, um, they are private for-profit businesses, but they are independent entities from the participants. I think that's important. That's beautiful. And uh, so I think that's a wonderful way to wrap it up. I, I invite you to, to, to in, in, see all the energy that you've created in the chat. It's really wonderful to see. Uh, um, there are, and there are many questions to follow up on as well. Uh, can you share the, the chat with me so that I can hopefully respond offline yes. if possible? Absolutely. We will find a way to do that. Uh, I, I want to also say I hope your health is in uh, yes. a better place. Yes, I'm. I'm good. The thirteen, almost fourteen years on, I'm staying better than ever. That is marvelous to hear. <laughs> That's a great way to to wrap this beautiful conversation up. Thank you so much, Joanne, for sharing your story. Well, thank you very much, and thank you everyone who um, participated.